What's up, guys? Welcome to Broke and Stressed, a PT student podcast where we talk about our lives as broke and stressed physical therapy students. Throughout grad school, you'll come to find that the struggles that you're having happen all the time to thousands of students across the country. You are not alone. In this podcast will share our personal stories and walk you through how we overcame some of our own struggles. I'm your host, Ruben. Let's have some fun, have some good conversation, and let's get into the episode. Hey guys, welcome back to Broken Stress. Welcome back to my podcast. Today we have Jordan Sai from Respawn Therapy, a professional esports physical therapy based in California. Go ahead and say hi, Jordan. Hey guys, my name is Jordan. Uh, so I'm a doctor of physical therapy and an orthopedic clinical specialist. Like Ruben mentioned, I own Respawn Therapy. I'm the founder, and I also own a small private outpatient clinic in Santa Monica. And where did you go to PT school? All right. Uh, yeah, so I went to PT school at USC uh, in downtown Los Angeles. Uh, I graduated in 2018. Nice. And then where did you get your OCS? I got my OCS this year. So I just found out I passed uh, about a month ago. Um, hey, there you go. <laughs> yeah, so it was good. Yeah. Nice. And where did you do that? Uh, so I actually did not do residency. When I finished school, I had gone through a really intensive integrated semester with a really good mentor. Uh, see, he was pushing me to do a residency and fellowship and all that. But coming out of school, um, you know, we'll probably talk about this later in my background. I'm, I'm a little bit older and I decided that I felt comfortable just working and I wanted to start treating patients. Um, so I decided to just see what was out there. In the first place I interviewed, I just kind of fell in love with the clinic. I really liked the staff and the owner. So I decided, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and start working and skip the residency. And one of the promises I made to myself at that time was, well, if I don't do residency, then at some point I have to study on my own and get my OCS. I didn't want the decision to not do a residency to affect my own goals and trying to hit the highest standard of, you know, clinical credentialing that I wanted to. Man, that's awesome. I've never, I haven't heard of that before. That's really cool. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you do not need to do a residency to get your OCS or any specialty, NCS, OCS, GCS, any of those. But um, it, it's not a bad idea. I think that residency does provide a lot of skills training, a lot of hands-on mentorship, a lot more didactic information. Um, it, it's more of a controlled way to go through your first year out of school. And it does, there are definitely a lot of benefits. It's not, you know, it's not a bad idea. But also, I, I strongly feel that residency is not for everyone. You know, some of us feel that, you know, when you get out of school and if you, if you're comfortable in your ability to treat and uh, get patients better, you can just go straight into the workforce. And I actually have a pretty good experience both ways. My girlfriend, um, we've been living together for a few years now. She was in residency when I was working. So I kind of saw, you know, what the demand was on her. She has her NCS now, um, slightly different population, but I got to see a little bit of both sides, you know, like what she was doing versus what I was doing. Yeah, that's awesome. And what um, general tips do you have for anyone considering maybe doing a residency or just not and just pursuing the OCS straight up, straight away? It's really interesting to each person, but if you come out of school and you feel that, okay, you know, I'd love to get more dedicated mentorship and make sure that I feel comfortable on my own, you know, once I am completely independent, the residency is not a bad idea. You always, you get a lot more experience in really good clinics with a good, strong, you know, foundation and academics as well, usually because they're associated with universities most of the time. That being said, there are some private residencies that are also really good. Um, I'm only familiar with this area, but, um, you know, they do provide you a more structured way to approach your first year out of school and really evolve into a better clinician by the end of that year. If you're choosing to not do a residency, then the onus is on you as a therapist and as a professional to really push yourself. And that's, it's hard for some people. What I liked about the way I approached it was I had a lot more freedom. And so it really afforded me more flexibility to pursue things like respawn therapy to, you know, I actually ended up taking over the clinic that I work at now. And so I, I think all of those things in my career would have been impossible if I was also doing a residency that year. And so when I compare my timeline to other people that a lot of my, you know, pretty much, I'd say like 75% of my class tried to do residency. And they, I think they said that our class specifically was the highest percentage of students who went to residency after than any other class previous. So I, I know a lot of people that went the residency route, but when I compare what we did in that same amount of time, you know, I do think that there's a trade-off, you know, when you, when you decide to put all your eggs in one basket in terms of pursuing academia, trying to push yourself to be the best clinician possible, you have to give up something else. You have to give up a little bit of career progression. You're going to start 
you know, a little bit behind in terms of, you know, your salary, you're going to start a little bit behind and repaying your student loans. There's all these other factors that do come into it. But if you decide to go the route I did, I'll be totally honest. I think that clinically I'm not as strong this year as I would have been if I had spent that whole year doing residency and then just pursuing clinical improvement. You know, there's a trade-off in everything. It's always a compromise. But I think for me, it was worth it because I got to pursue starting two businesses and um, position myself to be in a, you know, where I want to be versus, you know, kind of following the route of you have to do this. And I think that's one of the benefits of PT, actually. Unlike medical schools, we have the option of doing residency and fellowship. It's not a requirement. Yeah, I love that. And I love the fact that it is based on the individual. It is based on how you feel, where you're at in your practice. If you want to, you have the option to. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of pressure in academia to pursue residency fellowship, do all this, get all the letters, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> uh, but I do think that, you know, when, when, you, when you do study for these tests, right? Well, first off, too, doing a residency does not actually prepare you to take the OCS in terms of you can't just do your residency and then sit down and take that test. The next day you will fail. You have to study. And, and in that sense, it's uh, the residency is preparing you more clinically and to give you better clinical skills and, um, you know, differential diagnosis ability and just being a better clinician. The actual OCS tests your ability to learn all of the current evidence as far as CPGs and CPRs go. And so the two aren't actually related that much. Obviously, one is to prepare you to, to treat in that population, but when you actually sit down and take the test, it, it's really about how much time did you put in studying that information. Everyone I know that did the residency and now has their OCS studied just as hard as I did, if not more, you know, um, because they had already put so much pressure on themselves to pass that test as well. If I had failed the test, okay, yeah, I paid a lot of money. It was kind of a letdown. I studied a lot, but what, you know, in the end, it's fine. If you put in a year of your life in residency, gave up salary, worked your butt off, studied, and then did pass that OCS, that feels like a huge commitment towards an end that, you know, it would be much, much harder to deal with, I think. So it felt like people who did the residency actually studied harder than, I, than people I know that didn't do a residency but decided to take that test because there's just a lot more pressure from the commitment you've already put in. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that may not be true in all cases, but to me, it felt like, you know, uh, the pressure of doing and finishing a residency is, it, it makes that test mean a lot more because it's almost a culmination of that entire year and a half yeah, that you've, exactly. <laughs> you've been working. All the work you've been doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for me, it's like, I mean, I studied for about six months, but you know, it, like, it was actually, it was just me studying. So I was actually learning, exactly. you know. <laughs> So let's take a step back and let's revisit your experiences in PT school. But mm -hmm. first off, I'd like to start off my podcast with all my guests to share an embarrassing moment that they can remember from PT school. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, PT school is full of embarrassing moments here and there. I, I feel like I've forgotten a lot of them, but that's because, you know, you try to leave those in the past. But <laughs> um, the one, you know, one that stands out, I'm sure this is not a unique situation that, you know, any clinician or anyone's working patients for a while has had uh you know i was at a clinic outpatient ortho working with the lady um i remember i was like oh she's here because she has like right knee pain or something like that. i forget the exact diagnosis right so i'm doing stm i'm mobilizing that patella i'm doing all these glides i'm checking I'm like oh this feels good like we're getting some change measuring her angle you know making sure the range of motion is improving all this stuff and about 30 minutes into it she's like oh that feels really good but you know it, it's my other leg and so I completely wasted basically no that whole, whole session. And she just didn't say anything. She was just loving it. You know, she's like, oh, he's massaging my leg. He's moving. Like, and so, yeah, that was, that was pretty embarrassing. I was like, you know, you should have told me. <laughs> like, That's hilarious. But, um, she just let you keep going. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, just, it's my fault, of course. You know, I should have checked and I should have read the note a little better and figured out. But so on that note, you know, now I'm always like, you know, if you, I don't know. I feel like that's just one of those brain fart moments. It's just, oh, there's nothing you can do to prevent that. It's just, you mm -hmm. know, just don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Now but, that makes yeah. me worry yeah. that it's going to happen to me. 
<laughs> I mean, it's, I'll, I'll be totally honest. It still happens, but not to that extent. You know, now of it's course, like, yeah. I'll, I'll walk to the other side of the table and like, oh, it's the other arm. Like, we go back around. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, yeah, and, you know, and actually on a more serious note, that happens a lot in surgery. <laughs> really? There's actually a surprisingly high number of people who get operated on and it's the wrong limb. <laughs> No but, uh, way, that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Our job, you know, the, the repercussions are a little bit less. Intense. Are a little less, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Man, that's wild. Yeah, that's definitely, I think that's happened to me at least once or twice on a practical. So fingers <laughs> crossed that doesn't happen with actual patients yeah. coming up. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit about what your clinicals look like throughout your school experience. Cause for me, <laughs> mine's a little unique because, so we have four in total. Um, the first uh-huh. one is uh, like a sneak peek clinical, I'd say, I like to call it, cause it's only two yeah. weeks. So it's only two weeks, very short. And then the remaining yeah. three are all 12 week long-term clinicals. So what would your, okay. your like at your school? Yeah. So uh, SC is, is, and, and from what I understand is actually fairly unique in this, that we get clinical rotations throughout all three years. Um, your oh, first year, yeah, your first year you do a two plus six. So you get a two week clinical in the spring semester, followed by a six week clinical in the summer. Generally, that's at the same clinic you did your two week at. So you get that kind of sneak peek in, in the two weeks. And then at the six weeks in the summer, you actually go for a full six week rotation. And usually if you're a CI and if your clinic trusts you at that point, you might actually have patients. And so, yeah, my first year, I was at an outpatient orthopedic clinic, and the two-week um, rotation, I, I guess I impressed him. He liked me. He's like, hey, when you come back for your six, you're getting a full caseload. And now, for better or worse, you know, I can see the positives in that for me, and that I got a ton of great experience. You know, that six weeks, I was grinding. I was seeing 11 to 15 patients a day. Yeah. I was busy. Um, and I still got a really good feel for, okay, what is it like being a full-time therapist? But being a first year, you know, total, being totally honest, I obviously wasn't providing the best possible care. I didn't have enough knowledge to really be effective or as effective as I think I should be as a full-time clinician. So my personal opinion as a clinic owner now is I would never do that to a student. I think it's, it's a little bit, you know, it's a little bit uh, in some ways unethical, but also I, I hate to say that because it sounds judgmental of the owner, but um, I feel that it doesn't give your patients the priority as it, you know, they're not the fir- foremost thing in your mind when you do that, right? You're, yeah. you're kind of looking at profit margin. You're kind of thinking, well, you know, I want to get as many people in. I want the student to see as many people as possible. I, I think that if you're really patient centered, you would kind of use the education process around the student, not at the detriment of the patient. So looking back, I, I'm not that comfortable with that situation anymore, but um, my clinicals, yeah. So that was first year. Second year, we, we did kind of the same thing. It's a six week rotation and they try to diversify our settings. So again, USC has, as far as I know, the most clinical rotations out of any school in the DPT system. So we do a total, I think it's like 53 weeks of clinical rotations. So we did, yeah, you did the two plus six, we do another two plus six, uh, and then your third year is one 16-week full-time rotation where you're literally Monday through Friday in the clinic full-time, and then another 16-week integrated. So you're, you're in the clinic Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday, you're in class for eight hours. That's a really wow. intense semester. That's, that's kind of like, that's also kind of why I didn't do a residency because that was my very last semester of school and I felt like I was basically you were done. in a residency. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my, my CI in that rotation was like, I'm going to treat you like you're my fellow because he, he had a fellowship. He did residency. He's like, I'm going to make this the hardest semester of your life, but you're going to learn a lot and that's really going to prepare you. So when I got through that, I was like, you know what? I don't really need to do this again. <laughs> and it was actually actually at the, the USC faculty practice. So it was basically where the residents are. So that definitely influenced my decision making and not doing a residency too, because it was basically like I was in the exact same environment they were in and honestly working longer hours than some of them. So, but it was a great experience. I think I wouldn't have come out nearly as confident if I hadn't had done that. But yeah, we, we did a lot of clinicals. And so the goal for us was to diversify how many settings we're in. Um, I've done clinical rotations in inpatient, wound care. Um, I actually did my full time in wound care. So I did 16 weeks of that in the hospital. I did yeah. a sniff. I did outpatient orthopedics. I did acute care orthopedics. The only rotation I didn't get a chance to do was neurologic. And that wasn't entirely uh, an accident. I, I knew 
that, I mean, neuro is interesting to me, but I knew from my entry into PT school that I wanted to work in ortho. So it just seemed kind of like the least uh, applicable for me. And wound care was something I was just interested in anyway. And we kind of talk about that when I go to like my background before the PT school, but yeah. Man, that's crazy. You guys have a lot of clinical experiences. Yeah. Yeah. They really try to stress that. So mm-hmm. I, I think it's good because I liked actually that by integrating clinical experiences throughout your entire education process, every time you leave a clinical and go back to school and sit in the classroom, the information they're giving you seems more applicable and you have immediate patient cases that you're like, Oh, that yeah. totally reminds me of this one guy I could have done that with. And I didn't know about it. Um, so it, it really helps you integrate the, that information better and really put it together into a comprehensive, more applicable approach rather than here's all this book learning, here's anatomy, all this stuff. And then you piece it together later. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I definitely like that. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought it was a good experience. Mm-hmm. Now walk me through then after becoming a new grad, what was your job experience like? And then how did you become a clinic owner as you are now? Yeah. So uh, like I said, I, I was, you know, I graduated um, and I was thinking, I was, I was actually considering residency and I did interview at one residency and uh, after school, so me and my girlfriend, we decided to take a trip. I was gone out of the country for about a month and a half, you know, went to Asia, visit all, you know, do all the things that you couldn't do in PT school. <laughs> and so I basically didn't have hands on patients. I didn't see a patient for about two months. And that is a significant amount of time when a lot of your skill is kind of that, I hate the term muscle memory because that doesn't exist, but you know, the, the idea that you're familiar, you're comfortable doing evals, you're doing all this stuff kind of habitually. When that gets taken away, um, you know, I kind of felt out of practice. I was very rusty. And so going into this residency interview, I actually did, I did pretty poor, you know, I, I felt like I did a really, really poor evaluation and uh, I remember I, so I can't say entirely, oh, I chose not to do residency. Actually, I did apply to one, but when I didn't get it, I realized, okay, this is kind of a wake up call for me because either I continue to pursue that route and I really have to work hard at it, or I take this job that I just got offered and I have to improve myself. And I decided to go the latter because one, I was like, you know what? I, I didn't really want to do a residency. And I think part of that reflected in how I performed there because I, I really didn't practice before I went in, you know, I, I didn't spend any time brushing up on anything or working on my evaluation um, system or procedures. So I kind of just went in there cold and it showed. And, you know, I took that as a, you know, as a, it was a blow, but I, I took it as a learning point and a lesson. Clearly I'm not as good as I thought I was two months ago. And so I need to improve. So before I started work, I did put in that effort. You know, I went back through, sat down and did all the things that I felt made me a good clinician prior. Um, I made templates of like, here's how my evaluation should look. Here's all the things I need to cover. Here's all the questions I need to ask. I went over diagnoses. I tried to study up before just starting work. And then when I came into the clinic, I felt like I was ready. And I just, I started just crushing it with, you know, just working full time. And I I remember when I interviewed with the clinic, one of the things I had asked for with the owner was, you know, I want to eventually own a practice. That's been my goal since I started PT school. I want to eventually be a a practice owner. I wanted mentorship in running a business. And so I asked her about that. She's like, yeah, we can definitely do that. And then about six months to a year in, she kind of pulled me aside and she's like, look, I've been doing this 35 years. I want to retire and I'm planning on retiring this year do you want to take over as owner? And so, That's awesome. and so part of me was like, what are you talking about? You know, I'm a year out of school. Like, I don't know. <laughs> um, but then the other part of me, you know, uh, again, in history, like I'm, I'm a little bit older. Uh, I started PT school late. I spent um, three years in the, in the army prior to college. So I, I, you know, I felt like, you know, I'm 32 most clinic owners are actually about my age when they start. So even though I didn't have the, the practical experience of being a PT for very long, I felt like, well, this is my next transition point. It's just getting here earlier than I wanted. And the opportunity is not going to present itself every day like that. So I'm just going to take the plunge. Uh, I said, yes, you know, I'll, I'll be happy to, I, I'd be happy to take over, but given that you're going to mentor me for the next six months. And so she did kind of worked as a team. I basically ran all operations and I would just ask her for help whenever I needed. And we actually, there's a lot of hiccups. You don't have to get too much into the details of that, but I basically had to actually build 
a second company underneath this one due to some legal reasons and basically it built a clinic from the ground up underneath the existing clinic so we just carried over all our patients and therapists and all that but the structure like the whole corporation, all that was started from scratch, which meant that we had to reapply to every single insurance company we were previously contracted with. We had to wait about six months to hear back from Medicare. Like there was a huge, huge issue. You know, the first six months were rough and you know, it's been a rough, it's been a wild ride, but uh, right kind of when we started getting to where we were pretty stable, a COVID-19 hit. And so the last six oh, months has course, also been, of course. <laughs> has been pretty interesting. But, you know, when you look at it like that, right, like no one could have predicted this kind of stuff would happen in the grand scheme of things. You know, if we survive this and we are, we're, we're doing fine. We're actually doing fairly well. Surviving this means, you know, there's, there's nothing that's going to be thrown at me that I'm not going to feel somewhat prepared for. Like this is pretty much as bad as it gets for businesses unless, you know, there's like a world war or something. So Knock on wood, hopefully that doesn't happen. But <laughs> yeah, so I think that, uh, you know, for any young clinic or young PTs out there who are thinking about starting up a clinic or thinking about taking over, really weigh the, the pros and cons and really weigh the risk because um, I, I basically stepped into a, a business that wasn't actually that profitable, it was making negative money for a little bit, like we're in the deficit for sure. And I had to basically restructure how we do everything um, in order to turn us into a semi-profitable company. And now we're starting to come out of that a little bit. But the positives are, you know, the, these are experiences that you will never, ever get in a classroom. You can't learn how to run a business in a classroom. You have to just do it. And that's, I think, one of the hardest transitions for PTs as you start getting into the idea of opening a practice. There's nothing that will prepare you. It's not like, you know, like, for example, residency prepares you to treat patients and make feel more comfortable. There's nothing you can do to feel comfortable taking over a business <laughs> or starting a business. You're, you're, you're thrown straight into the deep end and everything that goes that could go wrong will go wrong. And you just have to kind of work around it. You can't plan for everything. You just have to deal with it. <laughs> Man, it's crazy. I love that story because I'm actually an aspiring PT business owner myself, hopefully in the future, huh? knock on wood. Yeah. But man, what, what do you feel like after, you know, being the clinic owner, how do you feel that you've grown not only as a clinician, but as a person just going through all this and just it's freaking out all the time, I'm sure, about organizing everything yourself, reconstructing everything from the ground up? Yeah, it's... Um... It's tough. Uh, to, to answer the kind of first part of your question, I do think that when you do something like this, and we talked about this earlier, uh, there's a compromise. You know, My clinical skills have been put on a back burner a bit because I've been so busy trying to manage a business and work the administrative side. I don't read as much literature as I used to. You know, My first six months out of school, I was constantly reading Con Ed, doing Con Ed, reading literature, trying to stay on top of stuff, writing my own guidelines for things for myself, you know, building my clinical knowledge and database. Once I took over as owner, it became very much like, okay, I need to learn all of this other stuff. I need to learn tax law. I need to learn insurance policies. I need to learn oh, man. You know, <laughs> business management. I need to learn how do I do my own financials, right? For both me and the business. And there's a whole other, like you can get a doctorate on this stuff, right? <laughs> like uh, business administration, right? So there's a whole other side to it that you have to devote a significant amount of time towards. And you just basically have to accept that your clinical skills are going to get put on a back burner. So the uh, compromise I made was, well, let me do this for six months. Let's get the business stable, as much stable as possible. And then that's when I signed up for those CS. And so that was kind of me saying, let's realign kind of my focus and really focus on my clinical skills and knowledge again for a little bit and work towards this, you know, definite goal. Um, and then I can kind of worry about the business. So I think that's kind of what's helped me as a, as an owner and as a clinician is being able to set a goal, a relatively short term goal and achieve that and then switch my focus again, you know, so that I don't have to, constantly be stressed about, oh, if I'm studying, I'm not working on my business. Or if I'm working on my business, I'm not getting better. I think it makes more sense for me to se separate those two things. I just don't do both at once anymore. Um, I try to focus a little bit of time here, work on the business. And once I hit this achievable goal, like, okay, we need to break even. Good. We get that. Now I can switch my focus over here and just work on, you know, devote as much time as possible towards 
pushing myself as a clinician. And now that I've gotten that, I've actually just recently kind of switched back the other way. Now I'm like, okay, let's grow our business. I'm looking at new space. We're going to hopefully move in the next six months to a bigger location, um, bringing in new therapists, expanding our marketing, that kind of stuff. And so I think as an owner and as a clinician, we're in those rare situations where we kind of have to do both. You have to be able to figure out what works for you, what system works for you, and then divide your time effectively. Yeah. It's really cool that you, that really cool journey that you've gone through in the last, <laughs> ever since you graduated, man. It's awesome. Now talk to me about how Respawn, where Respawn fits into all this. When did that start amongst <laughs> all this? Like you had so much right. going on to begin with. Right, so when did right. you decide to start Respawn, man? Oh man, it's funny. Um, if you had met me in undergrad, I was not the definition of workaholic. I, I was, you know, I was chilling. <laughs> and then I think <laughs> after that. PT school, it just flipped. I don't know, like a, a switch got flipped. But Respawn was an idea I had um, at the, my last year of PT school, right? So we're just working and everyone's kind of thinking, what's the next thing? You know, obviously we're all going to try to find a job, but what do we do after that? And for me, I, I think I was kind of seeing the state of the PT community at this point, uh, the, you know, just what everyone's doing, like what, what is success? What do you want to do? Do you want to work at a clinic where you're seeing 25 patients a day nonstop and then you do paperwork until eight at night and then you go to sleep and wake up and do it again? Like, is that the definition of, you know, career for you or, you know, and I, I was pressured from a lot of different directions. So for me, I think what really, what I've realized is you have to do a lot of introspection and find what motivates you and what pushes you. And, um, you know, for me, I, cr I wanted to get involved in esports at some level. I've, I've grown up playing a lot of video games. I've always loved it. Um, I always felt like oh, I was born a decade too late to go pro as a gamer. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, I felt like, okay, well, you know, listening to podcasts and watching like, you know, videos and stuff. Nowadays, I think to be truly successful, you have to have a niche. And that, that goes beyond PT. That goes into any field you, you want to get into. You have to have a niche. You have to have something that you can create and define as your own to really stand out from everyone else who's doing kind of the same thing you are. I think a lot of PTs are, and there's nothing wrong with it. A lot of PTs are very happy working nine to five and doing their job and then going home and having time for their families and all that. For me, I, I was like, I need to find something that actually motivates me to want to push and do more. And so uh, my very last semester of school, like I said, I created, uh, it was originally called Respawn DPT. And what it was, was uh, an Instagram account that was aimed at providing knowledge about your body to gamers, which I think is one massively growing population. Like every year, there's more and more kids playing video games. There's more and more professionals. There's more and more money being dumped into it. But at the same time, that is not synonymous with an increase in knowledge about how to take care of their own body. So what I was seeing was a lot of these pro gamers were retiring early or they were not doing anything in regards to physical well-being. And they were just hoping that they could play you know, five, 10 years and then be done. So wanting to get into that niche, I did a bunch of research my last year. I was trying to find, is there anyone's doing this? And I did find a couple other PTs, but not to the same degree. If you were to Google PT for baseball players, you're going to get blown up, you know, Google, yeah, for <laughs> like sure. there's going to be thousands of pages. You Google PT for gamers, you're going to see three hits, you know? And yeah. you know, of that, it's like how much of it aimed, is aimed at the general population? Not very much. So I was like, that, that seems like a niche that is still small enough I can break into. And I really want to do it because it's something I'm passionate about. So I created that page to my idea originally was I wanted to get enough interaction and involvement that I could kind of leverage that to approach a pro team and all this stuff and then maybe land a job with them. Uh, long story short, like it kind of went the other way where me working at this clinic, actually, I got introduced to a pro team, like kind, no of, way. kind of fortuitously. And so I turned that from, okay, one visit randomly here and there, whenever they needed it to kind of educating the team and their organization about, hey, there's a lot of stuff we can do preventatively. Like there's a lot of stuff that we can try to assess and treat right when it happens rather than wait until it becomes a full-blown like cervical radiculopathy or becomes a full-blown tendon over you know like there's all these things that you can prevent by just catching it early so like regular maintenance intervention and prevention is going to go so much further for keeping your guys playing and practicing without pain and so they thought that was a great idea so i turned that into basically a part-time job where i go in you know a couple of times a week and see this team um and from there, I've kind of grown it. So uh, I see a couple different pro teams, uh, pro, a couple of pro organizations now for different games. 
my goal is to eventually see as many as possible and kind of grow Respawn Therapy now into uh, an actual organization that can outsource PT to different teams as they need or to individuals as we're seeing a larger community of streamers, of people just playing recreationally for long hours. They also need to take care of their bodies. And, you know, if you're, if you're a major streamer like Ninja or some of these big names, your ability to play that game for 12 hours is the lifeblood of your income, right? So you can't take two, three days off. And so in some yeah. level, the overuse for those people is actually more intense than even the professionals. You know, the professionals obviously have a really strict practice schedule and all that, but they have days off, they have off season. If you're a full-time streamer, you have none of that. You don't get an off season mm -hmm. <laughs> every day because your community is dependent, your, your, your income is dependent on your community and your community wants you to play constantly. So yeah, that's, that's my goal is to kind of change the entire landscape of gamers and, and how they approach their own bodies and their awareness and the things that they can easily do on their own to prevent a lot of this stuff from becoming a long-term problem. That's so cool, man. I love that you found your niche that you're really passionate about. And I mean, you're yeah. seeing some great success with it. Like the fact that you're treating like professional teams now, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely think there's a lot of luck involved with that, but at the same time, you know, um, when I was, so I, I used to be in the army, uh, like I mentioned prior to college, uh, they used to always have a saying in the military that there's no such thing as luck. It's uh, preparation meeting opportunity. So all you can do is you prepare as much as you can. Right. So I was trying to already prepare myself to work with pro gamers. I was doing a lot of literature reviews and this is kind of before I took over the clinic. So I had the time to do it. I was building out like, common pathologies you would expect to see in gamers. I was doing as much research as I could into, uh, you know, uh, how to treat those pathologies. What are, you know, um, there's, and the problem is there's not a lot of research out there. Yeah, most of the research, yeah. The most of the research I was reading was more involved with desk workers and mm -hmm. people who work office jobs. Um, so I try to extrapolate from that, you know, carpal tunnel, all this stuff is, you would assume is pretty common. But what I'm finding now and actually working with these these people is that, there's a lot we don't know, and it's not at all what I expected. Um, I've actually never seen carpal tunnel in, in the last two years working with pro gamers. Never really? seen it. No. I've seen other types of nerve entrapment. I've seen ulnar nerve issues. I've seen some TOS. I've seen some cervical radiculopathies. I've never actually seen carpal tunnel. And really? so that's really interesting, right? Because you would assume that'd be the number. Everyone, every time I talk to someone about pro gaming, they're always like, oh, they get carpal tunnel, right? Like, never seen it. That's crazy. Um, yeah, which is really weird because they, I mean, I work mostly with PC gamers. So you would assume that typing, all that stuff would, would yeah. cause that. But when you think about the demand of how they use their mouse and their keyboard, it's very different than your like average secretary who's just typing constantly. I see a lot more tendon overuse issues. I see a lot of hypermobility. I thought they would be stiff, like, oh, you need to stretch more. No, these guys are super mobile. What I'm finding is that the majority of stuff we need to work on is strengthening. We need to improve proprioception. We need to improve control of the wrist and just overall strength. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's been a really interesting journey. I, I really, I think that's the next step for me is I want to start putting together research on it. Um, I'm trying to get involved with universities that are interested. Um, you know, a, a couple have actually talked to me about trying to do some research on it because more and more college teams are putting together esports organizations. I think that's the next step, but you know, COVID's put a damper on a lot of projects right now. So <laughs> we got to kind of resolve that first. Have you had your hand in research before? Uh, I wrote a case study uh, my last year of school um, with help of mentors. So we, uh, we actually did a evidence-based guideline for um, post-operative rehab after an ACDF or anterior cervical disectomy infusion. So that was a, it, was, it was just a case study, but it, it did really well. We got it approved and I presented it at like four different conferences, five different conferences, including CSM. And so we were, yeah, we were in some poster wards at AOMPT, um, which is the Academy of Orthopedic uh, Manual Therapy. And we also did uh, CPTA, their national conference up in Santa Clara. So that was the only research I've personally been involved with so far. But, you know, I, you know, it's funny, too, because when I was in school, it was like, I never want to do research. <laughs> like, it just doesn't seem like something that's interesting to me. But now that I'm out, I'm like, oh, I have so many ideas that I would love to explore and, like, you know, get more concrete evidence for and get some objective information on. 
especially in the space of esports, because I think that there's no not many people doing it. I and mean, I think I've already working and I've already seen the need for certain studies to be done because you know I'm going off of anecdotal evidence and what I think is best, but that's clearly not the the standard of what we'd like, right? We'd like to see empirical evidence to suggest that this is the best treatment. We don't really have it. No one's doing it. So <laughs> I'd, I'd like to somehow get in the forefront of that, but I know that's uh, it's tough. No, that's awesome, man. I definitely think you can do it, especially with this kind of, you're owning this niche, man. It's awesome. I, love that. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, I, I think, and, and I can kind of tell, you know, owning a practice is a lot of work. It's definitely a passion project and it takes a lot out of you to personally invest in, but uh, and treating patients, obviously, I still love that. You know, I don't want to give up my patient time to the extent of, you know, never seeing a patient. But I think esports is the one thing where I feel like driven to to really, really push it because I feel like because it's an open nation, it, because it's something I feel like I'm actually making positive change in everyone's lives here. You know, it's awesome to to see that, you know, some of these guys are learning that they can, they have some control over stuff. They don't have to just, you know, playing this game for eight hours doesn't involve having shoulder pain. Like it shouldn't, you know, it shouldn't yeah. be a part of that game. I think it's really cool. Um, and I, I do feel like that's kind of what my trajectory I want to keep pushing towards um, is get the clinic to a point where it's really sustainable and running itself almost. And then I want us to devote more and more time to that. It's like kind of a side secondary business. Yeah. That's awesome, man. I love that. Yeah. Well, I think that's going to kind of be the end of the podcast, or I don't have any more okay. questions, but as a final note, do you have any tips for any struggling PT students out there that are just going through PT school and just crying about how stressed they are? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I, I feel you. I've been there. Um, it's, it's a process. Uh, your goal in the end is to graduate, right? Once you accomplish that, that that's a very achievable goal, right? You should never... You should never be concerned so much about your grades or anything like that. Your goal is to graduate. Do well, do as, as well as you can, right? But don't stress about your grade. Your goal is to actually learn information. Once you're done with that, then you get to actually, that opens the doors, right? I wouldn't be able to do anything I'm doing now without that piece of paper saying I'm a doctor of physical therapy. But I, I know that once you're done with that step, that really, really vital milestone, then you can do whatever you want. Like there's so many ways to change your career trajectory and pursue things you want to do and really actually, you know, achieve things that inspire you that, you know, what you do in school is not what the rest of your life is going to look like. You know, I, I, I know a lot of people in the PT industry that are doing big things in different areas, you know, so like, um, I'm sure a lot of your listeners have heard of the prehab guys, the major PT media team, right? So Arash used to work at my clinic. Um, no way he was yeah he was he was my employee for a while and he recently left to pursue pre guys full-time so that was really cool but chatting with him you know he it's a lot of the same stuff it's like look PT school is a stepping stone towards doing what you want to do the whole career is not what you think it is now because it can be whatever you want it to be so I would say you know get through school however you can whatever it takes but in the back of your mind you should be thinking what do I want you know what do I want to do and then you should just pursue that because that's what's going to push you. It's like my last year, like I said, was the hardest year of my entire PT school experience. But what got me through was I had this idea my last semester of what I wanted to do. And I was like, I can't do that unless I finish this. Mm-hmm. And so that helped push me through the long nights of studying, the long nights of doing notes, just trying to get by and get through all this stuff. But you should also keep in mind that, you know, in order for you to, I'm assuming that most of the goals are going to be PT related. To, to really accomplish those, you have to be a good PT. And to be a good PT, you have to learn this stuff. Like this isn't just college anymore where it's kind of like, oh, I need to get this A. Like this information is going to be something that you might have to pull out of your head 10 years from now, having not studied it. <laughs> you know, like some obscure <laughs> red flag that one of your professors mentioned, right? You're like, oh, I might actually see that one day. And actually you might end up significantly changing someone's life, hopefully for the better because you, you've retained something out of that program. So, um, yeah, long story short, just, you know, have a goal in mind and, and remember why you're doing this and school ends eventually, right? <laughs> it has to. So yeah, you'll get through it. It's not that bad in the end. And you'll look back and you'll be like, actually, it wasn't that hard. Studying for those OCS is worse. <laughs> <laughs>
Man, I just want to say thank you, Jordan, for hopping on yeah. to the call today. I learned a lot, especially with me wanting to be a clinic owner myself and maybe even like pursuing a specific niche. Like I want to maybe look into treating like power lifters or something. Yeah, like absolutely. Thing. So yeah, thank yeah. you so much. for That's a lot of inspiration and knowledge you gave me. So, and especially and for anyone listening. If you, if you ever want any advice about the business or anything like that, definitely reach out. <laughs> cool. Thank you, man. And thank you guys right. for anyone that was listening and I'll catch you guys in the next episode. And take care. Bye. Thanks, guys, for tuning in to today's episode of Broken Stressed. If you enjoyed the podcast, make sure to smash that follow or subscribe button to get notified whenever new episodes are released. If you want to connect with me on social media, you can find me on YouTube or Instagram. Thanks again, guys, for tuning in, and I'll see you next time.